One of the emergent properties of mass is gravity, as described by Newton's equation. The mathematical formula for gravitational force is displayed here. The more mass an object has, the greater its gravitational pull, multiplied by the constant g. Debt is very much the same. At first, when debt is added to an economy, it stimulates growth, as it creates new credit for businesses to build factories, train workers, or construct buildings. However, as the debt continues to grow, so do the interest payments. At some point, the debt load is too heavy, and the mass of the economy causes it to fall into itself in a credit contraction, leading to defaults and deflation. Let's say you own a company making a net income of $100 million a year. With a debt load of $1 billion and an interest rate of 7%, you have to pay $70 million a year in interest alone just to keep the creditors at bay. If, for some reason, the company's income falls, or interest rates rise, then you can't pay your debt. The math doesn't add up. The reason why debt cycles exist is as fundamental as the laws of physics. When an entity can't pay its debts, or even cover the interest on the debt, what happens? It defaults. This isn't a machination of political pundits, or economics professors, or conspiracy theorists. It is simply a law of math. When this happens across an entire sector, you get deflation, credit contraction, and a downturn in the business cycle. But wait, you say. Governments issue debt in their own currency, which they print. Thus, they can never default. Problem solved. If they print money to stave off default, they only devalue their own currency. In other words, they don't default in nominal terms. They do pay back your $1,000 treasury bond, but in real terms, that $1,000 buys less stuff due to inflation. Post Great Depression, the Fed began to take responsibility for trying to control the business cycle, as they had just seen how destructive a credit bust could be, especially for the banking system. Thus, the Fed decided to take on a role of regulating the cycle. It could accomplish this by lowering interest rates and easing monetary conditions during a recession, spurring borrowing and lessening the rates of default to make sure companies can continue to hire and train workers as needed. During economic booms, they would tighten monetary policy to prevent the economy from overheating by increasing interest rates, thereby constricting monetary conditions and preventing excessive speculation and over-leveraging. They also do this to get interest rates high enough so that they can drop them once again during a crisis, as interest rate policy is one of their most critical tools. This policy is evident in the tracking of the federal funds rate, the interest rate at which depository institutions trade federal funds, which are balances held at Federal Reserve Banks with each other overnight. The shaded areas indicate a recession. After each recession begins, they drop interest rates down to mitigate the hit of the downturn. As the economy improves, they are able to raise them back up again. It's a near-perfect lagging indicator of a recession. How long do they keep interest rates low once they are in a downturn? No one really knows. The Fed is perpetually caught in a catch-22. If they raise interest rates too soon during a recession, they may worsen it or cause a depression. However, if they keep interest rates low to spur an upturn in the credit cycle, then they are sowing the seeds for the next crash, as the debt created on the way up must be paid back on the way down. When the economy is booming, if they raise interest rates too fast, then they cause debt payments to spike, which means defaults occur and the economy begins to roll over. There is no real escape from this conundrum. As you can see, the Fed has been fighting it for the better part of a century to no avail. It keeps reacting to crises in hindsight, never understanding that many times it is also the one that caused it, just like our firefighter coming to put out a fire he set an hour before. Each bubble bursting must be met with the Fed creating a bigger bubble. 1990 sees a mild recession, time to lower interest rates and spur a tech bubble. That burst in 2000? Now it's time to lower interest rates and start a housing bubble. That collapses? Start an everything bubble in 2009. Rinse and repeat. This process continually creates more debt, more inflated assets, and more risk in the system. Look at the chart. You'll notice that the troughs get larger and deeper, and the peaks get shorter. With each crisis, they are able to raise the rate to a lower level than before and have to drop it to a deeper level to get themselves out of it. Pre-1990, the Fed funds rate was at 9.5%. In 2000, it hit a cycle high of 6.5%. Leading up to 2008, it barely got above 5%, and then it was pinned to near zero post-Great Financial Crisis until Yellen finally decided to start hiking in late 2015. But even then, it took four years to get to a measly 2.5%. 
and even that could only be held for a couple of months. Why do they keep lowering interest rates and keeping them lower than before? Simple, just look at a chart of public debt to GDP for the United States. As the Fed has continued with this game, debt as a percent of GDP has continually grown, from a starting point of 30% in 1981 to 132% where we sit today. Elevated levels of debt means the federal government will go bankrupt if interest rates stay at historic norms, 6 to 8%. So the Fed has worked to suppress interest rates to keep the Treasury solvent. The Fed, with this trend of lower and lower interest rates in their vain attempt to kill the credit cycle, have created a financial black hole. The more they lower rates to get out of recession and stave off default, the more debt is created, piling on more and more mass. This pushes interest rates even lower, which creates more loan demand, and thus more debt, in a devastating feedback loop. This game will continue until the whole thing collapses under its own weight. That, or they burn their way out with inflation. Guess which path they're currently choosing. There has been much discussion of a taper, that the Fed will stop printing money to buy securities, and will raise interest rates to fight inflation. To me, anyone who believes they can accomplish this long term is being foolish. The Fed could barely get interest rates above 2.4% in late 2018 and early 2019 before equities began to fall into bear market territory and the repo market blew up. What makes them think they could get interest rates high enough to squash inflation with debt to GDP 30% higher than it was in 2019? Each time they begin this program, the markets react violently. Addicted to the heroin of easy money and low interest rates, the prisoners of the system, the banks and the US Treasury itself, are up to their eyeballs in debt, and any attempt to offload that debt is vehemently opposed. Disconnecting the Fed's liquidity hose results in immediate withdrawal, and it must be put back quickly if the Fed wants to avoid a full-blown deleveraging event. The prisoners demand ever-increasing liquidity, more and more QE, and pullbacks in money printing become ever shorter and fewer. The inmates are running the asylum. Bernanke assured everyone during the financial crisis that quantitative easing would be temporary and the tapers would be permanent. It appears the opposite is true. QE is permanent and the tapers are temporary. They can only reduce money printing for a short while until something else blows up and they're forced to start printing again. Much like a black hole, in many ways we cannot directly observe the phenomenon, but we can see its effects on everything that surrounds it. The financial gravity the Fed has created by incentivizing ever more borrowing has caused more and more distortions in financial markets, pumping junk bonds to absurdly high levels and creating shortages in repo. The weight of the debt is pulling the economy and markets down, but with constant money printing, the Fed hopes to stave off disaster. Much like a black hole, however, the process is exponential, and the longer the Fed keeps interest rates at the zero bound, the harder it will be to escape and the more money they'll have to print to get out. For those of us who follow economics and monetary policy, this exact scenario played out in 2018. The Fed stopped QE and began reducing its balance sheet. The markets, a few months later, started nosediving. I was actually on Wall Street at the time coincidentally, doing interviews and touring the banks for job offers. I talked to a lot of analysts, and their consensus was that this turbulence was bad, and with no more Fed support, the markets were due for a deeper correction. However, they also confidently asserted that the Fed would change its mind and start QE again once things got bad enough. The taper would not last forever. The markets would force the Fed to blink. Sure enough, they were right. From August to mid-December, major equity indexes dropped 20%, putting them in a technical bear market. I was there in late October, and pretty much every day saw heavy selling. December got even worse, and as the selling continued, worry began to spread across the financial markets. Powell stuck to his guns and insisted the balance sheet reduction would continue, barring another financial crisis. Here's a quote from an article on December 19th, 2018. Minutes into his press conference on December 19th, Powell was asked if the Fed is looking into altering its strategy of undoing quantitative easing by allowing its massive holdings of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities to mature off the balance sheet. Quote, I think that the reduction of the balance sheet has been smooth and has served its purpose, and I don't see us changing that, Powell said, adding that interest rates would continue to be an active tool of monetary policy. End quote. When Janet Yellen kicked off the unwind process at the end of 2017, the Fed outlined its intention to let the roll-off occur on autopilot, with no promise of reverting back to quantitative easing, unless there was a, quote, sufficient negative shock to the economy. 
December 24th, 2018, saw a big drop in the markets, a 400-point loss in the Dow, marking the third Friday in a row of red days for equities. Again, this entire bear market occurred without an external economic shock or default by a major U.S. bank. It was purely driven by the fear that the Fed would not restart QE and that the taper would continue. Not even two weeks later, everything changed. The Fed chairman, Jerome Powell, came out and recanted his earlier statement of a tapering program. He said that he'd stop tapering soon and that they may even begin QE after they'd, quote, re-examined the situation. Markets rebounded, and after QE began again in earnest, they started rallying hard. Many market observers did not understand the implications of what just happened. What some grasped, and what I was beginning to suspect, was that this series of events was a major signpost that something was seriously wrong in the financial system. The markets were completely dependent on Fed liquidity, and the Fed had blown a bubble in literally every single asset class in the financial markets. This bubble was able to be maintained only through constant and growing QE, and any taper of these injections resulted in immediate collapse of the bubble. December 2018 demonstrated that the removal of the liquidity heroin that the markets were addicted to resulted in rapid downward repricing of financial assets. The wealth effect the Fed had created was nothing more than an illusion. Something had changed since 2008. Although the National Bureau of Economic Research claimed that we had only experienced a recession, if we use their original definition, we actually had been through a depression. N. Burr estimates that we underperformed GDP potential by around $8.2 trillion in real growth since 2008, which would have mostly gone to middle and working class workers in the form of wages. Although there were no more bank failures after the fall of 2008, unemployment spread throughout the economy, growth slowed to a standstill, and many left the workforce altogether. Shockingly, if we divide the performance of the S&P 500 by the Fed's balance sheet since the great financial crisis, the line is flat. This means that there's been basically no real growth in stock prices since 2008, with the only rise in prices due to money printing. The correlation coefficient between central bank quantitative easing and the price of stock indexes is nearly one. The money printed by the Fed, because of the structure of the open market operations, is plugged directly into the treasury markets, and from there flows into equities and derivatives. This has served to primarily enrich the asset owners, financial institutions, and wealthy elites who own the majority of the stock market anyways. The entire rally has been an illusion, financed by the Fed and maintained through QE. In the black expanse of space, many things are not what they seem. The Fed is now trapped in a black hole of its own design. Continually crushed by the weight of the financial debt, the markets and economy itself keeps contracting inwards towards collapse. 2008 was a foreshadowing of what was to come, and in 2018, the system was beginning to unravel again. The Fed, desperate to prevent this, persists in heaping more and more liquidity and debt onto the system, desperately praying that there will be a way out. Each crisis requires exponentially more stimulus to be used to fight it. $100 billion for the tech bubble, $2.2 trillion for 2008, 4.1 trillion and climbing for 2020. The Fed is running out of time. They will almost undoubtedly try to taper to escape. Even if they try this, it will fail in time, causing a rapid collapse in asset prices. When it does, they will have to turn back the liquidity hose even more than before, as they try to escape the event horizon. The point of no return, where not even light itself can outrun the massive gravitational pull of the black hole. What they do not grasp yet is that they have already crossed the event horizon. Only hard choices lie ahead. The only thing on their mind will be avoiding another Great Depression. But to do this, they will have to print trillions more. This will only accelerate worsening inflation and unleash devastating feedback loops that lurk under the surface of our economy. Many a state has wrecked itself on these shores, but sadly few heed the warnings. As stated in an Artemis Capital research paper, on cold nights when the moon is full, you can watch these ghost ships of state making their journey back to hell. They appear to warn us that our resolution to avoid one fate may damn us to the other.